Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to introduce, introduce my friend and collaborator, Nico Capelluti. Nico is, come, is coming from Yale, where he's a YCAA fellow. He joined the Center for Astrophysics at Yale last year, so he's, he's been there in the US for a year. We date back for a very long time. We were classmates at Bologna University in the late 2000s. And um, well, late, late 90s. <laughs> late 90s, you're right. And uh, so Nico studied at Bologna University, where he got his um, uh, undergrad in astronomy. And then he moved to a <coughs> school at Max Planck at MPE in Munich, Germany. And he spent there a significant amount of his uh, uh, researching time. He was the first uh, uh, grad student, and then he stayed for five years as a researcher, researcher at MP. Uh, he moved back to Bologna for five years, and then uh, he realized that it was nice to uh, come to the US, and he got the prize fellowship at Yale. He has been working for a very long time in the Cosmos Survey from the X-ray um, point of view, using both the XMM and Chandra Cosmos Survey, and is going beyond this to uh, the other side of the wavelength range to the infrared, and so he will talk about today his studies on understanding uh, background fluctuation in both infrared and X-rays, and what we can learn from that about the very high redshift black hole population. Hi, thank you. So, by the way, my, my career was slightly shorter, but it's fine. <laughs> thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, so, uh, black hole, uh, supermassive black hole seeds and seedling are the most important missing chain in our understanding and evol of the evolution of supermassive black holes. And especially, we don't have a clue on how this object formed. And the, the reason is that we haven't seen them yet. And if you look at this plot, basically Chandra and XMM Newton, the, the blue points, didn't, wasn't able to select by themselves any of uh, object are actually larger than, uh, than five. All, uh, all we know about high redshift objects is uh, from uh, the Sloan or from Penn stars. So because the, num the, the, the solid angle covered by X-ray survey is limited, and so, so far we know only the, the tip of the iceberg of this evolution. If we want to know more, we have to boost the sensitivity of X-ray surveys and pair them with near infrared surveys, or going to study uh, uh, X-ray ba um, um, cosmic backgrounds to see the cumulative uh, um, signature of them. So first results I want to show, so we, want to, we wanted to boost the sensitivity on, of X-ray surveys, but without having a new telescope, there is no way. So we, ne we, we needed to invent a new technique. And this, this technique was to search for new X-ray sources at the position of known Hubble, uh, faint Hubble sources. And here you can see how we boosted our, uh, uh, our the depth of our uh, counterparts by going and searching for X-ray counterparts in the uh, uh, in candles, for example. And here in the tiny area of candles, using PhotoZ, uh, we were able to select new uh, eight candidate uh, sources with PhotoZ larger than four, and four of them actually probably are upper limits. And so the detection is not that strong, but uh, the message is that if you look at precise positions in, in, uh, in the X-ray sky, you basically boost the, the, the selection function of your survey because basically you suppress the noise and you look where, already you know, where, where you already know uh, we have uh, uh, a possible counterpart. And uh, with, with, such a, with, with a similar approach, Pacucci et al. 2015, looked for an uh, uh, object that had a, a spectral range distribution compatible with a late stage uh, evolution of a direct collapse black hole. A direct collapse black hole is an object that can form only in the early universe from pristine clouds of uh, hydrogen. And, they can, and under certain circumstances, uh, they can directly collapse and form a very massive black hole. And very massive black holes high redshift are the key to explain the fact that we have 10 to the 9 solar massive black hole form in less than one giga year, one billion year uh, of the history of the universe. I call this usually the billions problem, not the billionaire problem that we may face. Uh, it's, uh, the, this is, we call it the billions 
um, problem. But this, uh, we are at the beginning of this, uh, uh, of this investigation, but this is motivated by a lot of uh, theoretical work. So to explain the billion problems, we need to invent, to, to, to find out what are the new physical, mecha the, the physical mechanisms that we haven't yet explored that can happen only in the early universe, like, for example, the evolution of, of uh, uh, radical last black holes. And here we see a simulation where you see, uh, 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 while the time goes, goes on, uh, you see how the spectral energy distribution of this putative direct collapse black hole uh, evolves. Uh, so basically, a direct collapse black hole is basically a black hole hidden in a Compton thick uh, environment and is swallowing matter from this cocoon. Uh, the trigger for forming a direct collapse black hole is a nearby uh, a star forming galaxy that, by illuminating the uh, pristine uh, molecular hydrogen prevents fragmentation in the clouds, and so you can have a data collapse. So, and then here you see that as soon as the time goes by, the NH is going down, and the X-ray component is getting stronger and stronger, and also the, uh, the disk component that now appears in the IR, uh, and the reprocessed part of the SED is growing. And by the time that the black hole is about uh, 100 uh, mega years old, their emission is strong enough to enter uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the window of detection of Chandra and will be easily detected by uh, um, uh, JWST. I remind you to an inter interesting paper that we recently published from uh, Priya Natarajan et al., where we go into detail into that. And here was from uh, Fabio Pacucci's paper, uh, the first tech, uh, um, uh, color color cut to pre-select this object. We found out, however, that this preselection cut is not sufficient using only IRA colors. We need something more because this can degenerate with local galaxies. So we've taken a, a plethora of SED uh, templates and we developed uh, um, um, a new um, um, uh, selection technique that we want to apply to forthcoming JWST surveys. So the, we've taken uh, what we know from direct collapse black hole spectral energy distribution, and so we know that they will have a very flat uh, infrared component in the spectrum due to reprocessing. Uh, they, will have, they, will, uh, they have to be at higher redshift. They cannot form a redshift larger than 10, uh, lower than 10. They have to be at higher redshift, so we know where the Lyman break happens, and we know that they have to be strong X-ray emitter and they have to have um, uh, an extreme X-ray over optical ratio. So, and if you put this together, this selection criteria, you take a color color diagram, make a cut, and then to compare the color, the, flat, the, the flatness of the IR, IR part versus the X-ray over optical ratio, you see that direct collapse black hole might finish here. And this means that it's unlikely that uh, in, in, in current surveys, and this, so, and this is compared with <coughs> upper limits on, or, or measurements that we have in candles. And this means that it's extremely unlikely that in the current data sets there, there, are, there is a large number of them. So probably a few of them are detectable. But uh, since we cannot see yet uh, um, uh, direct collapse black hole or early black holes with, uh, as, 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 so, as discrete sources, we need to study their cumulative uh, uh, properties, studying backgrounds. So, here is one of my recent paper. I, thanks to the large area of the Cosmos Legacy Survey and the incredibly high quality of data, we are able to take a measurement of the total X-ray background that is shown there, and our measurement in excellent agreement with previous measurement, and we increase the statistics by a factor more than 10. Uh, but we can do more. Since the PSF of Sandra is so good, and uh, um, uh, the area is very large, we can still have a large area and mask all the known uh, Hubble sources down to faint magnitude and still have a very good spectrum of the resolved X-ray background and decompose it in its several uh, uh, components. Here are the gal galactic components, local bubble, and here is the extra, extra galactic part that we approximate with the power law. And by applying the Sultan argument, uh, by assuming that most of this remaining emission that is much less than 9% of the total X-ray background is made by high redshift black holes, taking into account still unseen star-forming galaxies, you apply the sort of argument uh, with a given um, uh, efficiency and uh, by knowing what is 
uh, the uh, uh, volumetric correction for putative direct colas black hole from synthetic SED, and we end up with this uh, uh, plot here where we show the uh, evolution of the accreted mass density from black holes versus SOS redshift compared with our results from the Sultan argument using different accretion modes and metallicity of the cloud from the colas black hole. So what you can see basically the message here that if you want that uh, to have direct collapse black hole in the universe and not to exceed what we already know from the quasar luminosity function, these have to be, they have to form an extremely low metallicity environment with extremely low, I mean, Z equal 10 to the minus 3 solar. So they are basically have to be unpolluted. Uh, but uh, a very powerful technique is to study the fluctuation of uh, cosmic backgrounds. So here is a, uh, and, and by knowing where we expect the emission of uh, the direct black hole, we can go and search in these energy bands for their emission and their signals of the fluctuation. Here is an image from the, UDS, uh, the EGS deep survey with uh, Spitzer that we observe also with Sandra. So once you mask the sources, you basically see that the remaining light is distributed in a not random way. So this fluctuation have a pattern that we can study. So, and studying this pattern is very powerful. Let me make you a comparison with something that we can, everybody, understand. So, let's suppose that we want to study uh, the property of sands in the desert, okay? And the analogy here is that the sand are the galaxies with high redshift, and some of these grains of sand are black holes, okay? But our telescope or our microscope is not good enough, and we see them from far away. So basically, we basically only see the dune of the desert and the ripples made by the wind or by the atmospheric agents. But already from the study of these ripples, we can determine important information about these uh, black holes, well, of, about the, the, um, the, the grain of sand. And here, for example, from the distance from the... Um, um, uh, of, the, of the crest, we can uh, uh, determine what is the intensity of the wind or the mass of, of, the, uh, of the grain of sand. But astronomers have a wiser way to do investigation is applying filtering to the electromagnetic spectrum. And basically, uh, if you look this dune with in, in the, in the X-ray, you basically see the contribution of the black grain of sand that are uh, the black holes. And if you look in the infrared, you see the, comp the, 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 the redshifted uh, component from star formation, uh, star forming galaxy or galaxy or uh, accretion disks. So, and what we did, we computed the power spectrum of these fluctuations. And here we have this very uh, uh, long-standing problem that the power spectrum of the uh, cosmic infrared background has an excess in power compared with what we expect from all the foreground uh, uh, RSO galaxies. And there is a long-standing debate on what is the nature of this. Some ones say that it's from low redshift, and some others say it's from very high redshift. If it's from high, uh, very low, uh, low, uh, low if it's from the local universe, then this is stripped uh, material from uh, galaxies, intrahero light, or if it's from the first population of stars, this is probably, from, from the higher redshift, this comes from the first population of stars or black holes. And if this is the case, we expect a correlation between the IR signal and the IR. And we measured it. And this, and this is the cross power between uh, the uh, cosmic infrared background and the X-ray background. So, and also here, we have a hint of a large scale excess that is still consistent with um, uh, um, high, with a higher redshift population. This component is local, though. Uh, but here, you see, the large-scale signal is very weak. Uh, and so we need to confirm these results. Uh, and study, especially, this part here. But from cross-traction, we know that whatever it is, it is produced by sources with IRAC magnitude very low, larger than 25, the IR, the IR component doesn't show any correlation within, uh, with uh, lower uh, wavelength um, uh, diffuse maps. And so this is an indication that the, uh, these uh, fluctuations have a Lyman break at around one micron. So what to do, what to do next? So we need to go and study uh, larger fields and better fields. But why, what is the link with direct black holes? 
So basically, uh, if you do the math, you take the SED distribution of black holes, study the possible environments that this direct cross black hole can have a redshift. You can fold together in a model and see what are, what are the expected fluctuation uh, of, uh, in the IR, in the X-ray, and the cross power. And you et al., the group of PISA, measure, uh, predicted that this is what we expect from direct cross black hole redshift. So uh, the message here, we are likely or uh, we are probably seeing a, contribu a, a contribution that is uh, uh, coming from this exotic population of black holes. And uh, uh, what, what to do next? So we need to confirm these results. We didn't, but some other group did it independently in another field. So this uh, uh, result that, uh, recently appeared on uh, uh, AstroPH from a, a competing group uh, that basically they were able to reproduce exactly <coughs> our signal, even if th this was done in Central Field South, so they have less uh, uh, shot noise. But on the large scale still, we are missing something. Um, we need to go and uh, study on larger scales. Uh, but to go back to dark collapse black holes, uh, so the model that uh, UA et al. proposed to explaining this cross correlation basically had a few variables. So one variable was the mass, the initial mass of the seeds, uh, the lifetime of the black hole, and the redshift, uh, the the um, high, the lowest redshift possible for these black holes. So basically, they find that if these are direct cross black hole, their mass is in between five, uh, 10 to the five and 10 to the six solar masses and they cannot exist a ratio, a ratio larger than 12.5. Uh, and they should live very shortly. But this model has a serious problem. So the serious problem is that if you take this scenario, uh, you basically make this black hole grow, you basically rap rapidly saturate the uh, um, black hole mass density by, let's say, a ratio uh, 12. So, Theories say that not all the black holes, direct cross black hole, end up to be in the center of a galaxy. Some of them are wandering, probably, in uh, somewhere. Uh, but this is still something that we want to uh, study, and we are working on a new theoretical model. But to work on a new theoretical model, with the quality of data that we have now, we can't do anything. So we went, searched for the best possible data sets, and we did it. So the best data set is Cosmos so far. So here is the splash survey from um, um, uh, the PI is Peter Kapak. It's a two square degree survey in the cosmos field. And here is the auto power spectrum in black of the fluctuation of the cosmic uh, IR background. Uh, and you can see that the statistics and the quality of the, t of the data is impressive. So this is only half of the field. So and we'll add the second half of the field, the data will be even better and go to larger, larger scales. That's what we want. So uh, to understand the nature of the signal, we cross-correlated these maps with uh, uh, the deepest galaxy catalog that we have and computed the cross-power spectrum. And here is the cross-power between these maps and whatever we know from uh, G uh, from G band, Y band, I band as a function of the magnitude limit. Okay, uh, so you see that what you see from this plot is that uh, on large scale you don't see a rise of the signal, and this means that most of the cross correlation that you see is from foreground galaxy. But uh, I told you before that foreground galaxy don't contribute to the signal. And to quantify how they, con they contribute to the signal, we compute the coherence between the IR fluctuations and these uh, catalogs, this fake uh, um, diffuse map, uh, um, um, with this fake diffuse map using known galaxies. And we see that the coherence, it is basically a way to, I mean, I mean we can, think it about the correlation coefficient. So, but basically you see that they, this uh, resolved galaxy, with resolved galaxy, I mean galaxy detected with super or hyper supreme cam, so going very deep to, let's say, a magnitude of 28 in wide band. So extremely, extremely faint. The coherence is consistent at large scale with zero, 
but on average is way less than 10%. So four grand galaxies produce only a small fraction of the observed cosmic infrared background fluctuation. And if you put this on a, in a plot, you see that the large scale fluctuation, let's say a 500 arc second, let's say 10 arc minute scale, it's consistent with zero all over the um, um, electromagnetic spectrum. This means that cosmic infrared background fluctuations are produced by very, very faint objects. So probably we will be able to see this object with WST. And what about X-ray? X-ray is the most exciting part of this game. So basically, we invented the way to study in a different way this fluctuation by cross-correlating with other bands. We already know that they correlate with IR, uh, with, with the uh, X-ray, and with the far IR. So, and the long-term plan is to produce the spectral energy distribution of these fluctuations. And for the X-ray, I went to revive an old friend of mine, the XMM Cosmos field. XMM with respect to Chandra, is not, you all know, that uh, doesn't have an impressive uh, point, um, uh, angular resolution, but it has a, a huge uh, collecting area and is very sensitive on diffuse uh, uh, sources like this faint fluctuation of the background. And we must X-ray sources detected by uh, uh, XMM, by Chandra, by Cosmos Legacy, and by Spitzer, and compute the cross power. And the results are this. Uh, not only we produce a cross power spectrum that extends up to degree, uh, half degree scale, that is unbelievable, but the quality, the, the improvement of the quality, you can basically see it here. So there is an offset, this is the comparison in the 0.5 to 2 kV band with new results from XMN Cosmos and my previous uh, EGS results. I mean, it's, a, uh, it's a, a leap forward in this uh, investigation. And not only it's a leap forward in, in the quality of the signal, but in the amount of information we get. So now that we can basically reconstruct the X-ray spectrum of these fluctuations. There is a small offset here that is basically due uh, uh, to some, both to the fact that we have a higher shot noise in XMM map that we have, haven't understood yet. Uh, so basically, this, uh, at the end, this map will shift down, uh, but uh, soon we will end up uh, having um, uh, the spectral energy distribution of this fluctuation. And if these fluctuations are actually indeed from high redshift sources, what we expect to see is, for example, to see something like that. This is the expected spectral energy distribution uh, of the fluctuation if they are produced by high redshift black holes. And this point is what we already know. Uh, so we are working, we are looking forward to work on these uh, two parts with XMM, Chandra, and hopefully in the future with Athena and the X-ray surveyor. But here is, uh, we have already very interesting plans with Euclid. So we, uh, NASA uh, gave us the opportunity as a team that we call it Libre, uh, looking for in infrared background fluctuation with Euclid, uh, allowed us to join the European Euclid team. They gave us uh, a grant uh, to study uh, the, this fluctuation with Euclid on very large uh, fields. And uh, this is going to be the next step in this uh, in investigation. And uh, in this way, we will be able to actually fit our data with uh, direct collapse black hole models or investigate if this uh, fluctuation comes from a local uh, population of object that we haven't accounted for. And that's about it. Thank you. Questions for Nico? Uh, it's nice. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we are planning to look at the radio, yeah. We don't know what instrument to, to use because it's, uh, it, I mean, ideally we should look for 21 centimeter. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, we are thinking about, we, we are evaluating what to do with LOFAR, but um, it's going to be far in the future probably.
It's the lemon break, yeah, yeah, it's the lemon break, yeah. Yeah. So you expect to see all the power then? We expect, yeah. Oh, so in the Mitchell Wind paper uh, that recently appeared, they cross correlate this fluctuation in the IR and uh, infrared with Hubble maps, and they didn't find any correlation. So, uh, yeah, the point that is missing, that I, I forgot to mention that even with deep Hubble images, we don't see a correlation between this IR fluctuation and these very faint Hubble images. So that's very, that's kind of tricky. April. Um, thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me because I like, don't feel comfortable. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay. Um, so I want you to give this talk because I've been on this job only for less about six months. So I'm still learning, even though I think that now I get most of the things interesting things about the archive. And I find that as a very, um, I was postdoc only like seven months ago, and I didn't know most of anything of the operations of the archive, and how the archives works with all the other CXC groups. So it's been a revelation, a very exciting time for me, trying to learn and catch up with the complexity of the organization. And I wanted to transfer to you this kind of excitement and interest as long as I actually feel that, then it will become normal and probably will fade away. So data archiving is the result in general of practices and procedures that support the collection, long-term preservation and access, and the dissemination of scientific and technical data and their metadata. So this is a very general definition that you can find on Wikipedia. How does this definition translate in terms of what the Sandra Chandra Data Archive does? Actually, we as a member of the ARCOPS archive operation team, we maintain the whole record of mission from proposal to pro publication, all the data products, all the metadata associated to the different steps of the processing of the data, and everything that you can, pretty much everything that you can think of. Uh, we support all CXC operations, and I will show you in what way. We provide data access to its guest observers that our, that together with, um, together with the CXC um, uh, family are our primary customers in some sense, and then we provide access to all data, and again, the metadata produced by Chanda to the astronomical community uh, as a whole, forever. I wanted to just put this slide here because I was not aware of who was doing what when I was here as a postdoc, and I spent five long years. So this is the archive operation team, and uh, led by Arnold Roths, and I, I'm the latest uh, hire for in, in the last seven weeks, um, well, for uh, seven months ago about, but we work in very strict close collaboration with the archive development team, which is a, ma which is a part of a different uh, team inside the data system group, which is led by Yuli Zografo. And I just wanted to, to point out that one of the members of the team, uh, Menelaus Perdikas, has just been hired like a few weeks ago, so welcome. And this uh, is a very short description of the tasks, the basic tasks of both uh, teams, but I will focus on this one because then it will be clear what we do in the archive in the remaining of the talk. So they basically create and code the archive art architecture and the infrastructure that we use to operate the archive, including database and file management servers. They design and develop, in collaboration with the ARCOPS team, um, the interfaces for both the internal access, access to data and the external public's access to data. And of course, they operate the web servers for the archive and support all, ki all kinds of archive operations. So, what really struck me as very interesting and to be very sincere, unexpected before I joined the team, is that the archive 
uh, is very central in almost every aspect of the operation of the mission, which is an interesting thing from my point of view. So, um, as a postdoc, I have this very simple um, like picture of how Chandra produces data and what this data um, hap well, what happens to this data. So, um, proposers have brilliant ideas that translate to. Uh, uh, proposals. These proposals, if they are lucky, they get approved and the Chandra uh, peer review. And the good folks over the mission planning and uh, science operation teams uh, trying to find the optimal combination of scheduling and observational parameter to actually make the, the observer's dreams true. And then these operations are translated to commands to the, to the, um, that are sent up, uplinked to the, um, uh, to Chandra, actually, the telescope. Uh, Chandra observes the targets and everything is sent back. Everything that it collects is sent back to Earth where a lot of people, mostly people in operations, try to, um, try to actually extract the most information and to make a, a very thorough pre-processing of the data that are then sent in a very short time to the guest observers as a private FTP, well, in a private FTP um, uh, servers. And after usually years, this data become public for everybody to use. And like more or less at the same time, they get stored permanently in some kind of like digital warehouse. So that was my, my, my picture. And based on this picture, it was very easy for me to figure that actually this process, which is linear, not actually linear, it's curved linear in some sense, but it's, it's definitely not two dimensional, uh, could be, separate split in two parts. What happens before and uh, before and while Chandra is taking the observation, what happens later? And I actually modeled my expectation and fears and hopes of how the Chandra archive would work on this wrong picture. Because the picture, and that's, again, this is not an official ARCOPS diagram and it's still a draft, because that's based on my personal notes that I was taking the first few weeks. So what I really understood is that actually ARCOPS, and of course it's a archive-centric, actually an ARCOPS-centric SSCX map. So please, I apologize for all the other groups that I didn't mention, because actually I didn't happen to think that their operations were, were so re relevant for the ARCOPS operation, but it's just a way to um, show how I thought of the ARCOPS. So I thought that the ARCOPS is a member of the data system group, and we work in very close connection with the ARCTE, which is a member of the software team, and with hardware, and the operations, and the CalDB groups. But we are in very close connection with the uh, Chandra Director Office for everything that, of course, um, um, has to do with proposals, the accepted proposals, and the adjustments that we need to do in order to accommodate proposals that are based on target of opportunity or um, other things that not fully enter into the schedule, long and short time schedule. But we also have a very strong connection and professional involvement with the science operation team and mission planning for all it comes, for basically for what it comes to the the parameters that, uh, the, from the parameters of the um, detectors that are used for each of the observations, and mission planning for what it comes to the schedule and other things like that. It's a very simplistic representation, believe me, but still. And then we have other less strict connection with the science data system and with calibration, mostly through CalDB. But the idea is that I got a glimpse of the truth, that this was not a linear process, and actually it was most like a two-dimensional diagram. What I found really helpful is that we can actually highlight the kind of uh, integrity and centrality, I'm sorry, integration and centrality of the ARCOPS in the whole operation using a couple of plots that Arnold produced in his paper in 2002 together with other ARCOPS members. So let's start, let's try to look at this plot. I will talk about the database, the story of database. So for people that are not aware, a database can be like described as a collection of tables which have some common parameters that can be used to actually mesh them, okay? That's it. The idea is that the most, one of the most important database that the archive operation team maintains is the so-called observation catalog. So, going back to the previous picture, someone has a brilliant idea, the, his, his or her proposal is accepted, and the record is creating this observation catalog before actually people in mission planning start uh, looking at the proposal and start to actually find the optimal strategy to make that happen. This arrow now, uh, these arrows represent the exchange of information and in other terms how this uh, database is updated by different teams. 
Once mission planning has come up, and of course science, of, um, science uh, operation teams has come up with the good combination, the best possible combination of parameters, then uh, the whole thing, the package of commands that have to make this strategy work are sent to Chandra. And Chandra observes the targets and produces telemetry that is sent back to Earth, and it's usually passed through automatic processing, AP. Some of the data products are cached in a, in a, in a storage that makes, uh, makes it possible to actually go back at the data if we need to do something more. But at the same time, AP looks at the record that's been created for the observation in the observation cell to make sure that everything is required for that kind of observation has been done in processing. And at the same time, it updates the status of, for these observations in the observation catalog. Again, uh, a double correlation. Then, when we are happy with what uh, automatic processing has done or everything strange has come up and we actually fix that, these data products can be sent to a permanent archive server and copy of that, I won't go into details, they are not uh, relevant for my discussion. And, and again, these data products are sent to a large FTP repository and again, uh, that can be used by external users and internal users to actually look at the properties of this observation and to in the end, make new science. So the cycle closes when we look at other users that actually can search and retrieve Chandra data and actually uh, come up with more brilliant ideas. So that's the kind of, s s s well, it's a kind of organization that it really tells you how central the operation of the archive operation teams are for at least what is concerned about planning and how observation are reduced. But I would like to focus, so this is the story of one database, but of course there are many more of them. So I want to focus on this small area here. I will just zoom in and use another uh, very useful slide, um, um, actually a diagram from Arnold's paper in 2002, which just shows what happens in this small area here when we zoom in. The most important thing here, again, databases, and operations like actions. The most, the takeaway point here is that another very important piece of the whole process is called AP status database, which is another database or table or whatever it is, actually I'm not 100% sure, where that keeps the status of the processing of the observation. That's very important because it basically, that's what allows us to reconstruct the operation that have been actually performed by operation by all the other teams working the observation, and that would allow us to go back and re-actually process this data with the new calibration uh, data, or actually correct, uh, fix issues, if any, and so on, or improve our analysis. So the interesting thing is that there are different, different kinds of steps. The telemetry data come down and we pass them to automatic processing. If specific required needs um, occur, then we can go to other kind of processing. I'm not going to because that's not what I do. But it's interesting that we have different kind of databases that actually are updated that then keep track of every single of these steps. It's a very complex endeavor. As you can see, it's very integral to the operation of a large chunk of the, of the observatory. At the end, if everything goes as expected, which happens most of the time in a very short time, and this is really a kudos to the operation guys, which make it happen in less than 12 hours on average, something like that, then the upstart, the, um, the API start information, other information for other database actually populate the database that I talked to you about previously, which is the OCAT, and we are ready for public release. And we're done with databases. <laughs> the idea here is that this is actually a couple of little stories to tell you some kind of fundamental model that's been used to design the, uh, the archive operation, the Chandra archive, archive, which is actually an integrated way, which does not keep separated the uplink and the downlink parts of the, of the processing. So what happens before the observation are observed and what happens later? This kind of model, which at the time that it was actually implemented and designed was very like, uh, was ahead of the curve, was in, I guess, at the late, uh, last years of the previous century, <laughs> I would say in that way, actually has a cost because it takes a thorough, um, a thorough and solid understanding of the requirements and on the metadata, the data products, and now the different parts of the operations or the mission will work. It needs to be, uh, it needs to be um, rigid enough to keep uh, groups uh, honest, in the sense that it's not possible to change drastically what's been planned, but at the same time it has to be versatile and flexible to allow for necessary changes. But at the same time, it's actually, 
it makes it difficult to strike the right balance because it's so complex in Michelin and Chandra. I can even imagine how these guys did before Chandra was a thing and was actually working around here. And it takes time, effort, and resources. But they got it. They got it. And now we are actually um, we are actually benefiting from this kind of design in terms of the fact that it's basically the major positive effect is the integrity. So the fact that almost all the data produced by data uh, by Chandra, I'm sorry, are are um, are uh, well behaved data that we can, whose history and life we can trace back in every single detail, and we can basically making mo the most out of the data produced by Chandra. Of course, it's also useful from my point of view, which came like 20 years later, because spurred critical discussion about the metadata and data products, and I'm also interested in this kind of thing. And I will actually recall, I will um, go back to this point in the last two slides of my talk. And they also produce a very useful large scale vision that keeps everything coherent and makes Chandra, together with other kind of things and the talent of people that have worked to this mission so successful up to now. But we told you that like the inner works of the, of the Chandra Cups are just one of the duties. The, in, the interesting, another interesting thing and probably the most interesting thing for uh, outside users are the interfaces. I will focus on external public interfaces. So the basic two goals of these interfaces to make the data produced by Chandra searchable discoverable, and to facilitate access to such data. Of course, it's not as easy as it sounds, because different users have different criteria and different, produce different kind of requirements that in turn um, would require very general universal interfaces or specific interfaces. Just to make a few examples, if you're working in CXC, you need different kind of access to data than if you are a guest observer or if you are just an astronomer working somewhere which has nothing to do with the observations but just want to use the Chandra data. And that's becoming the norm. Actually, this is becoming more and more important as Chandra data keep, rev um, well, um, stay relevant and, be, and are used multiple times. And I will show you some kind of quantitative, um, of this, uh, quantitative representation of this. At the same time, we are fighting against technology development, which especially in the, in, in the fields of web, because of course most of these are available, most, most of these interfaces are available um, uh, through the web, it's evolving very rapidly. So it's a catch-up game, which is not easy to. Well, the most, actually, the most general interface that we offer is Chaser. Chaser allows you to found, actually returns um, observation around a given position on the sky or a name of a source that you're interested in, or a multiple, a list of different sources using um, a quite, uh, a quite uh, comprehensive combination of observational parameters. What it's returned, it's a list of the OBS IDs, so the basic pieces of data that we release at level um, in the primary and secondary data package that um, users can download. And we have, um, we have uh, the most important metadata for this data that can be not only represented in this way, but can also actually, we can have a, a more specifically at the metadata of a single OBS IDs in this kind of representation. And one of the, uh, one of the lists, when we select one of the OBS IDs, let's say, um, um, which is this one. Yes, sorry. Um, and, and, and the interesting thing is that now, since there are OBS IDs which are connected to each other because they were basically taken for the same proposal or for the same sequence and there are different kind of hierarchical structure that I'm not going to describe here, now a new thing that has been in place in, well, late today that I came in, is that you can look at the, at the uh, related observation when you are looking at the metadata of single observation, so that you could have a more comprehensive, complete look of the different kind of observation connected to the first one. Of course, as I told you, there are other kind of search or questions that will be much easier to answer using a specialized interface, and that's um, the case for the Chandra footprint service. The question here is a slightly different. I'm interested in a region in the sky, which or a point in the case or location, and I'm not, I'm not sure whether this point in the sky has been observed or not by any Chandra proposer. And so we can find like data, Chandra data. So I can actually um, use uh, the name of one source or the coordinates and I can have a look at the footprints, so the extent of the sky to different chunk observation. It's a very nice, faceted uh, interface that allows you to select per instrument 
Um, but the interesting thing is that you can see here there are tabs that will return different pieces of information from for all the OBS IDs whose footprints are plotted here. So if you go further down, you can see this list, which is searchable, and you can actually filter on the values of some of the columns using Boolean, um, Boolean uh, syntax. And at the end, you can, um, and once you're interested, when you pick the kind of website that you're interested in, you, can, you are pointed to, the, to a place where you can download the actual data. Again, there are other kind of questions. How do Chandra data connect to the literature? That's a very interesting question. And I will tell you, I'm pretty sure that all of you are aware of that, but I will be um, uh, more specific in a couple of slides. So we have another interface which is called the Chandra related literature, where users can use both constraints on the bibliographic metadata and constraints on the data references inside these papers or articles or proceedings and so on. And that's not the last one. As you, most of you are aware, I'm pretty sure all of you are aware, there is a new level um, has been added to the hierarchy of Chandra um, data products. A level one, level two, and now there is something called level three, which is actually a new reprocessing of data, which is required to actually create the Chandra source schedule. So a list of detection of sources, I'm sorry, observed by Chandra in all the data public up to a certain point. So the point is that here we are focus shifting from an observation-centered query chaser to a special query, centered query, uh, footprint service, to a bibliographic one, the bibliographic service, to a, actually a per source search. So let's say that you do not know anything about X-ray astronomy, you don't want to know. You just want to know whether your source, your favorite source, has been detected by Chandra, if it happens to be within the footprints of Chandra observation. That's the kind of, what you are going to query is actually a table, because the first and foremost result of the Chandra source catalog, it's a table, where there is a list of sources with some photometric and coordinates parameters, but every single of these rows, so every single source, is attached to data products that are basically the images, well, the event files. So the images, the spectra, and the light curves of whatever you want to call them. So there was a need, the glaring need, for a new interface that would make the easier for, it will make easier for uh, users which were used to chaser and other kind of interface to actually query the Chandra source catalog. And that, that's been done with the CSC view that allows in some kind of friendly way users to interactively build the query which mixed in a arbitrarily complex way spatial constraints and constraints based on the value of these parameters, be them photometric or spectral or position based or uh, variability-based and things like that. So you can build, I'm not going into details, you can build actually constraints interactively by dragging and dropping in these windows values that you can find in Chandra source scattered, you can create constraints and queries. And then you are returned with a table which represents all the, all the sources in Chandra source schedule that actually satisfy those conditions. And once you are interested in some of the sources and you're okay with the content of the table, you can just download the table, do whatever you want with it. If you are not and you want to look at the actual data that produce these numbers, in the table, you can actually retrieve the single data products for each source in the Chandra source catalog. So you can see that it's a more complex um, interface because it needs to cater to pretty complex requirements. And of course, I'm also proud, and I wanted to add this slide because I've been working for the Visual Observatory, I'm also proud of the fact that the Chandra X-ray Center is probably one of the most VO-compatible and VO-compliant data archive out there, in the sense that we have an array of virtual observatory, we have mostly ArcDev and software teams have implemented an array of virtual observatory protocol that allow you to do things from interfaces that are not specifically Chandra base. So let's say that you want to search Chandra source catalog sources within a given radius, there is a concert protocol that will, will allow you to do that using Topcat, for example, or from the, from the, uh, oh, just writing a simple um, script from your terminal. And there is simple, and there are similar things for the simple image access that allows you to in directly access the data products behind the Chandra source catalog thing. And same thing for the tap interface, which is basically the equivalent of Chandra's CSC view from the, from the interface. So it allows you to 
create the SQL query. I, I promise I was not going to say SQL, but anyway, it's a language used to query databases in, um, from, uh, from, you can write a script and you can do that automatically in batch mode, let's say. But I told you about bibliography. That's another thing that really struck me as very interesting and well, I didn't know a lot about that. So, and out of the duties of the Chandra archives to actually create a complete record of mission, including the links to the data set in the papers and a list of papers that are Chandra related in a very general sense. The contents, we are, of course, we are interested in the contents of this paper in terms of the collection of all the papers that are connected with the mission, links to the data in the archive from the papers and the extensive array, well, a list of metadata that are used in the papers for the analysis. And of course, we are also uh, interested in how these translate to the actual record of the mission because we want to keep being alive and we need to show how relevant Chandra still is after more than 50 years of operation. And we all know that it's, this is the case, but we need to show that with hard facts and numbers. From the operational point of view, I can tell you that this is a very labor intensive, a very difficult to automate task. Basically, it's almost impossible at this point. Some technology could help us going, uh, going forward, but it's very difficult. So people have to look at the papers and try to understand if they actually comply with our constraints. And we, of course, are using our special geographical location to actually take advantage of the very strong partnership with ADS. So there are different kinds of metadata that you can use to actually classify papers. I'm just doing a few examples. We can have, have a look at the relation to Chandra. So whether this was a science paper or was based on the observatory and was describing how, for example, the observatory works on other kind of, on other kind um, of uh, connections. The data links are one of the most important thing. If you're using OBS IDs, uh, Chandra observation, you should tell us, you will be very kind of you to tell us uh, what kind of OBS IDs you use so you can, we can make the link work very easily. This is not the case by far. Of course, there are publication specific keys like the type of publication, referee, the proceedings, poster, or else, and the journal keywords. And there are content specific keys which have to do with how the, the data were anal analyzed, the kind of data, I'm sorry, the science, the instruments, whether these data were used in connection with other um, uh, data produced by other observatories, and of course, the type of proposal and the grants, which are all useful information. But the point is that we produce numbers out of this huge work. And the numbers are actually compelling. Because if you look at that, I'm just going to point to you that there are, as of yesterday, because last time I checked, there are actually almost 6,500 papers which are in some way connected to Chandra. And are actually Chandra science. I'm sorry, no, this is a large number. So this is a very, let's say, a very, 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 um, it's, 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 it's actually a very conservative estimate. So it's the most conservative estimate that we have. And they ref, re, refer to, reference to uh, about 11,500 OBS IDs, so single channel observation. That gives, on average, that every single this paper refers to 11.2 OBS IDs. And on the other way, every single this 11, 1,500 OBS ID were referred to in, on average, 6.3 papers. That's amazing. But of course, numbers are not as descriptive as plots. This is an interesting plot that's been around for a long time, and this is actually not very up-to-date, but still holds. It only takes oh, take almost about one year and a half, something like that, in order, um, well, for most of the uh, observation to be published, right? So this is the time between the observation and the first publication, the first publication. And that's not very surprising. What really is surprising is that people keep reusing Chandra observations. So this is a plot actually that shows the years that a given OBS ID has spent in the archive and the percentage, um, this percentage of exposure time that has been used, a publication, how many times it's been actually published. You can see that after like eight years, about 50% of the exposure time has been uh, published one, one, two, three, four times. And things keep getting better as the data age. So this is a very, very strong, strong evidence that Chandra is aging, well, Chandra data is aging very graceful and keeps its relevance. Why are we interested in this? Because we need to show that Chandra is very relevant. We all know that because there are unmatched observational capabilities that at this point are nowhere to be matched. And if they will be matched 
far in the future, but still, it's a matter of trying to convince people who fund this mission to keep funding it at the same level or something similar in order to keep doing a very important stuff. This is the most convincing, these plots and numbers are the most convincing um, evidence of the continued relevance and lasting scientific impacts of Chandra. Of course, there are implement, implementation aspects to the archive that I'm going to like mention very quickly. We have two full copies of the whole archive, one located at the OCC and the other CDP. We protect the proprietary data for, from access um, that are not allowed in the first year on average, uh, most of the time, and we create the FTP archive for all and maintain for all the public observation. We work in very close connection with other data center or data aggregator like the CDS and, ED, and IDS, of course. And one of the things is that we are working uh, at the end of the mission, the management of the archive will be actually transferred to HESOC. HESOC. But let me talk about the future, okay? So, the idea is that it's a very peculiar and very successful model just because Chandra is so successful, okay? And because I, I hope that I convinced you that it's very central in how Chandra operates. So, can we actually um, apply this model to the next big thing in X-ray astronomy, which will be from our side, X-ray surveyor? I think so. X-ray surveyor will be a bigger, better Chandra. That makes for a much larger amount of data produced, but we are not seeing any drastic change in the order of magnitudes on in the scale of this enterprise, which is from the data archive point of view. Of course, from the scientific point of view, it's a completely different story, but still, 50 times trans sensitivity, these are the nom nominal goals. We know that whether it will be approved maybe it will be dif slightly different. Chandra-like angular resolution, a 16 times Chandra field of view at this angular resolution, and uh, five times larger spectral resolving power are huge accomplishment improvements from the sensitivity point of view. They are something that we can actually handle with uh, some preparation and the experience that we gained in, this, in the Chandra operations from the point of view of the data archive. So we hope that it will happen and we'll be ready to actually handle it if it will happen. But the problem that was very, very, very accurately depicted in this paper by Berryman et al. in 2011 is that our case is a very lucky case in terms of the overall uh, stage of astronom astronomical facilities. We are still limited by how good we can be at building mirrors. And we know that we can do these mirrors too large because they're heavy and there are some I know, that's not my field, but I'm just saying, we are actually still fighting with the ways to collect more photons. That's not the case for the rest of astronomy. Um, Bruce Berman pointed out that the archive growth, at a certain point, it becomes very, 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 very challenging for the facilities that we've developed so far and for the kind of development and design plan that we use so far. Because if you look at that, if your archive keeps growing, at a certain point, the storage cost will go high in some way that we can really, we can really um, anticipate. Or even if we can anticipate, the funding is usually done at the beginning of the mission and it, it's very unlikely to go up, usually it goes down, well, right. At the same time, if we have more data, people, users, astronomers are going to ask more from the data. And that's going to actually increase the usage of the archive and the array of capabilities that users expect the archive to provide. And of course, there will be issues with the in-situ analysis because if the data are too complex, then it's gonna be basically impossible, practically impossible to download the data. So we need to allow astronomers to analyze their data where the data are, and so new infrastructure, much complex infrastructure. Again, much ex a lot, uh, very expensive. And of course, there will be the need for more complicated and more sophisticated ways of querying the data, just because it's not only the amount or the, like, the mass of the data, it's also, it's, it's also the complexity of the data. So there will be high dimensional data that can be sliced and diced in several different ways. We have to let people be able to do that. Well, it's not. You got the gist of what I was trying to say. And of course, all of this brings to actually very elevated costs, which is not something that with the given design of the archives, it's something that we can, I guess, uh, tackle at this point. So the idea is basically how we should answer to the very simple question, what do we do with all this data? And of course, I'm in, in no particular orders, I'm thinking about at the LSST, at the giant Magellan Tesla telescopes, which is a home prod product, the W first, and this is James Webb and Gaia and Euclid, then SKEI. 
So every single archive actually facility has its own specific kind of answer to this specific question. But the idea is that very soon the archive, every archive, will become the heart of every observational facility. And actually, the model that's been used to design and to implement the uh, Chandra Kai is a very nice early attempt to address this problem. It's working fine. And so it's a very nice and good example of things of, from, of where we should start from looking at the next wave of generation of Chandra Dita Kai, of, well, of uh, astronomical archives. And that's actually one thing that when you start looking at the inside, it becomes really relevant and really compelling. Are we ready to go to the next generation of observational facility? And how can we as archive be ready, get ready for that? And that was my last slide. Thank you. I'm, I'm pretty sure there is someone in the audience that has this kind of the, I'm not sure. Sh uh, it's, what, what's the fraction of data coming from large projects? Uh, am I right, Nico? No, what fraction that uh, is still uh, publishing lots of paper after many years that comes from large projects? Oh, that's, uh, I <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that would actually be a very interesting thing to look at because one of the ideas of the large programs is to exceed the return, right? Not so it's necessarily to exceed the return. Um, it's often to create um, uh, what we consider legacy data sets. So um, at this point in Chandra, we've been able to, if you take a look at how observations have been done, a lot of individual programs that took maybe four or five cycles to observe, maybe today we would just say give them one large project. Um, so we've been able to fill that in. Uh, so it's, it's not a simple picture that um, large projects are supposed to be at a higher rate of publication. They tend to be slightly higher, but not significantly higher. <laughs> Actually, if, if you look at the uh, exposure time percentages, they uh, the, the, the publication rates really go up to fairly high percentages of, of exposure time. So that's got to be a mix of, of, of short and, and long programs. Yeah, but does it matter whether it's over a period over many years or whether they were awarded as a large program? Uh, no, it, 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 it doesn't. Otherwise, you wouldn't get right. up to those high percentages. Right. 